So this class I've taught before, if you've been here a long time, um, this is the third time I've taught it. So every four years I break this class out. This year is a little different. I added to the lesson plan quite a bit. Um, but it comes with a disclaimer. Here's my disclaimer. I, I joked last week that I was probably going to make someone mad. And here's what I mean by that. Um, there are some people, and we'll talk about this here in a second, who are convinced you should never talk about faith and politics, especially in church. Well, I'm going to step all over that. I'm going to talk about both. Um, that might make some of you uncomfortable. It might irritate some of you. I do not apologize. Because I, I honestly believe God wants us to talk about these issues and talk about the election. Some of you might think I don't go far enough. Um, there's a reason for that too. You will not hear me overtly endorse anybody. Now, if you listen close enough, if by the end, you know, this will be done either today, it might go into next week, but by the end of the class, you will, if you pay attention, you will know who I'm going for. But I will not endorse anyone. There's also a reason for that. I've read some history books. I'm not a history expert, but if you know anything about um, Hitler, in his relationship with the church. Has anyone ever heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Christian who opposed Hitler. And his story is so remarkable because he's one of just a few Christians who opposed Hitler. And what happened is when Hitler, you probably know way more about this than I do, but when Hitler came to power, he wooed the church to the point that they were all in his camp. And by the time they realized how evil he was, they had sacrificed their authority to speak out against him. You won't hear me endorse anybody because whoever wins, when they go against God's word, I'm going to call them out. And I'm going to reserve that right to do so. Okay, so I won't, I won't endorse anyone. And the next disclaimer is I wouldn't teach this if I wasn't confident in your spiritual mat maturity. And I, I mean this uh, like Pastor Tony just said, we're going to be respectful of everybody. Democrat, Republican, my allegiance is to God. That's right. Jesus died for everybody. Um, so I am completely confident in your ability to not make fun of any other side and not make you know jokes and poor taste. I think we can do this in a mature way. So it doesn't include my jokes. I may make some bad jokes throughout this. So, I just think the way we talk about this tonight should be different than the way they talk about it on Facebook, the way they talk about it on Twitter, on the media. We should look different as Christians, right? So, I'm going to answer some questions tonight. First thing we're going to talk about, again, I'm not going to talk about who you should vote for. I'm going to talk about how you should vote. And, and when Pastor Tony says we should vote the Bible, I believe that's the best possible advice he can give us when it comes to the election. Vote the Bible. So we're going to talk about what that means, how you should vote. We're going to talk a lot about how you should vote. And when we talk about that question, the reason I don't answer who you should vote for is I don't have to. I do not have to answer that. I'm completely confident that the Holy Spirit who lives in you will direct you as to who you should vote for. If you listen. If you listen. I don't have to tell you. And I don't want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to God's word, listen to the Holy Spirit. He will tell you who to vote for. Okay? So, I'm going to talk about how you should vote. Um, I'm going to start off with talking about why you should vote. And my biggest fear when it comes to this election, and I think it happened in the last election, there are a lot of Christians who do not vote. And there's some reasons behind that we'll talk about. But I want to convince you you should vote. Then I want to help you understand how you should vote. And then we're going to talk about some of the issues that I think are important, biblically speaking, in this election. So statistics show that the majority of Christians 
six out of ten do not engage their faith and their Christian beliefs when they step into the voting booth. Six out of ten say they suspend their religious beliefs when they vote. Why do you think that is? I've got some theories. A lot of it has to do with how we were raised. So again, that's a great answer. And here's what I mean by that is, have you ever heard of this phrase, and I'm sure you have, separation of church and state? It has been hammered into all of us that there should be a separation of church and state. You do not mix the two, and it's taboo to do it. Stu? Well, the way they explain it to you, or don't explain it, the way they tell you, it's the complete opposite of between church and state. We're going to talk about that here in a second. Stuart said it's, it's the way we interpret that phrase is the opposite of the way they meant it, and we're going to talk about that. You're exactly right. We tend to vote, what Pastor Tony just said, we tend to vote with what uh, impacts our pocketbook the best, right? And honestly, before I was a Christian, that's how I voted. I voted with what benefited me the most. And I think that's how the majority of people vote. But I want to talk about this phrase, the separation of church and state, just for a second so we can understand it. Uh, it might surprise you that the phrase separation of church and state does not appear in any of our country's founding documents. It is not there. It's not in the Constitution. It's not in the Declaration of Independence. It's not in the Bill of Rights. It's not there. Where it appears is in a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Danbury Baptist Convention of Danbury, Connecticut in 1802. This was a, he, he was writing as a private citizen to the Danbury Baptist. And he uses the phrase wall between, a wall of separation between the church and state. The point he was trying to make to the Danbury Baptist was about religious liberty. And he said we should maintain a wall between the church and state to maintain religious liberty. And his point was that if the government gets involved in the church, that's going to violate their religious freedom and their liberty to practice their religion. He was stressing to them why that wall of separation was important. At no point was he suggesting the church should stay out of politics. What he was suggesting was the government should stay out of the church. That's what he meant. Now, in the 200 years since then, that has been twisted around to me, we should never talk about politics in church. That's just not the case. We absolutely need to talk about politics in church. Um, the First Amendment of the uh, Constitution talks about religious liberty. And the special interest groups, certain politicians want to take that away from you because it's going to impact the way you vote. We should consider our faith when we vote. It's just common sense. Uh, 1954, in another attempt to shut Christians up, they added something to the tax code called the Johnson Amendment. The Johnson Amendment says that you cannot endorse in the church or campaign for a candidate and maintain your tax exempt status. I'm not endorsing. I'm not campaigning. I'm discussing God's word. We are absolutely 100% allowed to do that. Um, and I would suggest that even if I wasn't allowed to do it, I would, because it's that important, all right? So I'm gonna violate all kinds of, uh, they say that if you wanna ruin a good dinner party, talk about faith and religion. I'm gonna ruin your dinner party. <coughs> Ronald Reagan said in 1980 to a group of pastors in Dallas, he said, I know you can't endorse me and he was talking about the Johnson, Johnson Amendment. He says, but I can endorse you. So he kind of understood how it worked. Uh, turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 5. I want you to see something here.
You're going to Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Now in this chapter, Peter and the apostles have been drug in front of the Sanhedrin, who were the authorities of the time. And the Sanhedrin had just ordered Peter and the apostles to stop talking about Jesus, to stop preaching and teaching uh, the name of Jesus. Peter's response has a lot to do with our discussion tonight. Peter in chapter 5, verse 29 says, But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. So that's one of our guiding principles tonight. When, when man tells you not to talk about politics and religion, no, I'm sorry, I've got to, I've got to obey God. And I've got to obey God's word. So all of this leads me to one foundational principle. Civil government is a divine institution. It's ordained by God. It's quite the opposite of maintaining a separation between church and state. I will tell you that government is ordained by God. It's a divine institution. We cannot talk about government or politics if you're a Christian, without talking about God. It was his idea. Government was God's idea. Uh, turn to Romans chapter 13. Romans 13, verse 1. I want you to listen closely to what Paul is saying here. Paul says, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Paul is saying the government, those people in power, are established by God. Government is a divine institution. When we went through, um, a couple of months ago, we went through all the dispensations. And it started with the dispensation of innocence, Adam and Eve in the garden. Then we went to the dispensation of human conscience. And if you remember right, what we learned was when left to their own conscience, Men are capable of doing terribly evil things. Cain killed Abel. So when that dispensation ended, it started the dispensation of human government. Human government was established in response to the sin of man. It was established by God. So Romans 13.1, Paul just told us that God established it. Uh, turn to Genesis 9, verse 6. This will teach us the primary reason government exists, the reason God established government. Remember, Cain killed Abel. Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. This begins the dispensation of human government. It says, Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. So if you kill, if you end the life, if you murder a human being, you're going to be held responsible to other men. That's government. Government exists primarily to inspire people to do good and to try to discourage them from doing evil. That's why we have laws. That's why we have a government. That's the primary purpose of a government. It's to discourage people from doing evil. Uh, God established it for this reason. And here's, here's my question. That if we believe 
God's word that God established government, then those six out of ten people that go into the voting booth and they disengage from their faith, they don't pray about it, they don't talk to God about it, they suspend their knowledge of God's word for the moment it takes them to punch that ballot. Aren't they making a huge mistake? They're making a huge mistake. When you step into the voting booth, that's the time to lean on God, not to forget about him. We need to lean on God to get us through this. Now, I've told you that government is a divine institution. So does that mean that all governing authorities are intentionally serving God? No. In fact, there's some governing authorities that are pretty evil in the world, right? I mean, because when I talk about divine institution, I'm not just talking about the United States government. All the governments across the planet. It's a divine institution. God ordained it. But that doesn't mean they're all serving God and serving his will. In fact, God allows... I'm going to try to explain this. It's all about God's will, right? We're going to talk about God's sovereignty. But God wants the government to encourage you to do good. Jesus died for you, and he wants you to accept him as his Lord and Savior. He doesn't make you be obedient, correct? He's never made you do it. He wants you to have the freedom of choice to serve him willingly. In the same way, our governments have the freedom to make decisions. Under God's plan... They're going to follow God's will and they're going to encourage people to do good and discourage them to do evil. And we see this all through the Old Testament. When you look at the kings that ruled Israel, you would have a righteous king who served God and they would be blessed. And you would have an evil king. And then you'd have a righteous king. And then you'd have an evil king. We see it all throughout history. It's the same way today. They have the freedom of will that we have individually. Governments have it. But God's sovereignty is not limited by our will. And here's what I mean, all right? Turn to Psalm 103, 19. Psalm 103, verse 19. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. So when I say, when God's word says that the Lord's sovereignty rules over all, that means all government, right? God's sovereign over every government on the planet. Daniel 4.17 4, says, The Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind. In Daniel chapter 4 we see the King Nebuchadnezzar who is the ruler of Babylon, an evil government. We see God in Daniel chapter 4. God drives him away from mankind to go live with the beasts of the field and he says you're going to live that way until you recognize I'm the most high God. God is sovereign over even evil <laughs> rulers. He was sovereign over Nebuchadnezzar. Um, If God is sovereign over government, let me ask you this question. Why does he allow some governments to make unwise or even evil decisions? Free will. Sorry? Free will. Free will. All comes back to free will, right? But can God use an evil nation yes. to accomplish his purpose? Yes. Absolutely. Have you ever read the book of uh, Habakkuk? If you read Habakkuk, you will see... God using an evil nation. Turn to Habakkuk chapter 1. I'm saying all this to, to kind of come to a point. If you go to Habakkuk chapter 1, I recently learned that I've been pronouncing Habakkuk wrong my whole life. 
I've always said Habakkuk. It's, yeah, it's Habakkuk, and I think Tony's the one that told me I was wrong. I didn't tell you this one. That's it. Sound good to me. So none of us really know. Call them whatever you want. Habakkuk. Chapter 1, verse 11. Now here's, here's Habakkuk's problem. God has told Habakkuk that he is going to use the evil nation of Babylon to judge Israel. I'm going to bring Babylon to judge Israel for their sins. And Habakkuk's got a problem with that. Habakkuk's got a serious problem with this. And God tells him in chapter 1, verse 11, he says, they will sweep through like the wind and pass on, they being the Babylonians, but they will be held guilty, they whose strength is their God. What God is telling Habakkuk is, I'm still going to hold them guilty. I'm still going to hold them accountable for their evil ways. However, in the meantime, they're going to serve my purpose and I'm going to use them to execute my judgment upon the people of Israel who have been disobedient. It blows Habakkuk away. He can't understand why God would use an evil people. But that's exactly what God is telling him. I'm going to use evil people. So under that principle, I would tell you, whoever wins this election, just like the sign says, God's got this. God has got it under control, no matter who wins the election. So here's my, here's my question. And I'm going to ask this because I've heard a lot of Christians say this. Once they understand that God's in control, God's got this, no one's going to be elected, that he doesn't allow to be elected, that he can use anybody, why do we need to vote? Why do you even need to vote? God's sovereign whether Clark votes or not. I would argue you need to vote. He is in control. He is going to use whoever wins one way or the other, but we need to vote. And I'm going to give you uh, three reasons why. It's probably more, but I'm going to give you three really good reasons why we need to vote as Christians. Number one, if you turn to Proverbs chapter 14, I would say the progress of a nation is directly related to the state of its morality. The progress of a nation is directly related to the state of its morality. And in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34, it tells us something very important. Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. Righteousness exalts a nation. God has placed Christians and he's placed the church in a position to serve as the conscience in the moral, uh, the, the moral thermometer of our country. We point the way when it comes to that. People look to the church, they look at you individually to see how are you going to respond to things. How is a Christian going to respond to the state of our world? How does the church respond? We are the thermostat for the country. We're the moral conscience. And we, we obey the Great Commission. And we go out and we make disciples. We teach them to obey Christ. We preach sin. We preach heaven. We preach hell. We are in effect being the moral compass of the world around us. We speak to the morals. They can't. And I've told you before, you don't even know what good is if you don't know God. We have to serve as the moral compass. And when you sacrifice your right to vote, you are saying, that's not important. <coughs> I am not going to serve as the moral conscience, right? I believe God's word tells me that it is important for us to do our duty and to serve as that compass, as that conscience for the unbelieving world. We know God. I can't expect an unbelieving world to know what's right and what's wrong. We have to show them, and we show them by voting. We show them by leading the way. We should be packing, honestly. <laughs> There's so many Christians. 
people that call themselves Christians in the United States, if they all did their due diligence and they went and voted, we could change the world. <coughs> the problem is we don't. The problem is we don't exercise that right. We have to get in and vote. Secondly, Matthew 5, 13 and 14. I'm just going to read this. I'm not going to make you turn there just for sake of time. Matthew 5, 13 and 14 says, and he's talking to you. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket. Put on the lampstand, and it gives light to all those who are in the house. When you don't vote, when you sacrifice that right to vote, you are in a, essence putting your light under a basket. You're again saying, I don't need to shine my light to anybody. I, I'm, I'm not going to participate. I'm going to let this just play out. I'm not going to serve as an example. I'm not going to be that moral compass. I'm not going to be the light that God, that Jesus tells me I'm supposed to be. And the next reason, and I think this one might be the most important. We know that God ordained government. Government is a divine institution. That should be very important to us in the United States if we understand how our government is set up. We are a specific kind of government. What you always hear people say is that we are a democracy. We are not. Sorry to burst your bubble. We are not a democracy. We are a constitutional republic. There's a difference. A democracy is governed by the majority will of the people. The majority tells people what the laws are. We are a democratic republic. So the way our government works is we the people are the government. We elect representatives to go to Congress, to go to the State House, to represent us. They, in turn, represent us when, they, when it comes to these national policy discussions. If they don't represent me well, I get rid of them and vote for someone else. So, the, our, what we the people, that's the first three words, right? That's what it's saying. We the people are the government. God ordained the government. He is telling you, you better take your responsibility serious. And if you want your Christian voices, your interests to be heard, you better vote for people that represent you well. If you don't, and then later down the road, the government's trying to take away your religious liberty and they're trying to take away your right to worship the way you want, it's your fault. You should be voting for people that represent your interests. If they don't care about me, I'm not going to care about them enough to vote for them. Tony said earlier, we vote for people that, you know, selfishly, it comes back to my pocketbook. Well, shouldn't my religious liberty and my right to practice my faith be more important than my pocketbook? I need to vote for people that are going to represent the interests of my faith and my church. Because I'm telling you, there's a lot of politicians that want to take your rights and your liberties away from you. We better vote for people that aren't going to do that. Before, it, it'll be too late eventually if we don't. Okay, so it's very important that we vote. So we should vote. So now the question comes back to how should we vote? How should we vote? We always say vote Bible. I'm going to explain to you what I think voting Bible means. First, we should vote prayerfully. We should vote prayerfully. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. This point is going to come with a challenge. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. It says, first of all, then I urge 
that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. He's saying, pray for kings and all those in authority, all those government officials, the politicians. Vote so that we may have a tranquil and quiet life. He says, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Um, some of the stuff I see, if I'm being honest, that I see on Facebook, when it comes to religion in this election, there's not a lot of prayer involved in those posts. We should be engaged in prayer when we talk about this, we should be voting. Our vote should be bathed in prayer. And here's my challenge. Uh, the, the election's November 3rd, correct? 10th? 5th. 5th? Yeah. Okay, so we've got almost 30 days, right around 30 days. 34? You got way better at math than I am. 34 days. For 34 days, I'm going to ask you to pray for this election. Even if it's just five minutes. Include it in your daily prayers. That's how important I believe prayer is. We need to pray that God's will would be done. We need to pray that the church would be represented well in this election. We need to pray that the Christians will get out to vote. So every day I'm going to ask you to pray. That's the challenge. We should be praying. We should be voting prayerfully. Secondly, we should be voting Someone needs to pray for my handwriting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he didn't have for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Jim says that he's been praying for my handwriting a long time. We should be praying confidently. Uh, we've just talked about God's sovereignty, right? The sign says God's got this. God's in control. God is going to be sovereign over whoever wins this election. And a lot of times I see Christians who are all doom and gloom. If my candidate doesn't win, it's the end of the world. I mean, it might be. Look at the world around us. But, as Tony always says, if it's the end of my life, you're threatening me with a good time, right? I know how it all ends. We've studied Revelation. We've studied end times theology on, on Wednesday nights. I know how this is going to play out. I know when the world gets chaotic that I'm one day closer to the rapture. I'm not too stressed out about the election. Because before it gets too bad, I'm gone. I pray you go with me. We're not going to hang around for too long when this gets, gets, gets bad. So we can vote confidently. Get in there, vote for the candidate that best represents your Christian ethics, your Christian principles, your Christian beliefs, and do it with the confidence that God is in control. Just like Habakkuk, we need to learn to live with the fact that God's in control, God's sovereign. I can't do it, God's got it. So we can vote confidently. Next, we can vote according to God's agenda. And we're going to talk about his agenda here in a bit. I think there's a lot of issues uh, that are important in this election. But let me ask you this. Is God a Republican or a Democrat? <laughs> God is God. God is God. I really expected someone to take me up and answer. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll talk about uh, how to interpret God's word later. But no, that's, you're right. That's a, da that's a dangerous question. You should never ask that. Can I make a point? Can Please. I make a point? Yes. One, all of what you're talking about, though, precludes the fact, or includes the fact that you know what the issues are about. So you've got to be aware of what the issues are and how they relate, either pro-Bible or not. Amen. Amen. And that's why that's why I've added. And that's a wonderful. Jim just said, if you couldn't hear him, he said you have to know what the issues are. I've added some to this lesson, but we're going to talk about them. 
I don't know that I can talk about all of them, but I'm going to talk about the ones that I see as being um, the most important. So I asked, is God a Republican or a Democrat? Turn to John 18. There's a reason I asked that question. I've met, I've met Christians who were just diehard Republicans. I've met Christians, believe it or not, one of the that die hard Democrats. Okay? I met both sides. John chapter 18, verse 37. Says this. Actually, I'm going to go back. I'm going to start in 35. Pilate answered in, in John, 8, John 18, verse 35. Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation, he's talking to Jesus, your own nation and the chief priests delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered. He says this, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore, Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, he says, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus says his kingdom is not of this world. Philippians 3, chapter 20 says my citizenship is in heaven. I'm a dual citizen. I'm a citizen of the United States and a citizen of heaven. Jesus says his kingdom is not of this world. And I would argue that as Christians... When someone says, are you a Republican or a Democrat, you should say, I'm a Christian. My identity belongs to Christ, not to one of the parties. Parties will let you down. I've been let down big time by some political candidates in my life. I identify first with Jesus. I'm going to vote for the candidate that I feel best fits my biblical principles, but primarily, I identify with Jesus, not a party. And I, I see a lot of people that vote blindly down political lines. You know, I'm going to vote all left or all, all, all red or all blue. I'm going to vote Bible. I don't really care what party they are. I want to know do they align with my biblical values, and I'm going to vote for that person. Okay? Uh, Joshua 5, 13, 14. I love this passage. If you would, turn to that. Joshua 5, verses 13 and 14. Now in this passage, Joshua is about to lead God's people to war against the city of Jericho. And he runs into a representative of God's army. He runs into an angel here. And look at what it says. Joshua 5, 13 and 14. It says, Now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or are you for our adversaries? Are you for us or are you for them? And he said, No, rather I indeed come now as a captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, What has my Lord to say to his servant? The captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. So God's people, Joshua is about to lead God's people to war, and he runs into an angel and he says, Are you for us or are you for them? And you would expect this guy to say, of course, I'm for you. You're God's chosen people. That's not what he says. He says, I'm for God. I represent God. And that's my answer when someone says, are you a Republican or a Democrat? Now, for years and years and years, I would have told you I was, I was a pretty diehard Republican. I'm a diehard Christian. I represent God. He's going to influence the way I vote. Amen. So that's why I say... You should identify as a Christian. Vote on the side of God. Vote on the side of the Bible. Not vote on the side of a political platform. 
So here's a question. It, I just added this to this lesson because I hear a lot of people ask this question. How can I vote for a flawed candidate? Don't have a choice. You're right. We're going to see why you're right. And here's, here's what people say. Well, I don't really um, identify with Kamala Harris, so I can't vote for her. You know? And then Donald Trump, man, he's just he's so rude. He's so uh, abrasive. He's so out there. On, honestly, I can't even read his tweets. So I can't vote for him because I just don't like him. How can I vote for a flawed candidate? And what happens, and I'm convinced this happened in the last election, a lot of us didn't. We couldn't find a candidate we liked, so we didn't vote. Well, let's talk about that. Here's the first thing you need to know. I don't know why I write this on, on the board. God uses flawed people. Understand, God uses flawed people. I think sometimes as Christians, we get caught up in trying to find the perfect candidate. I'm not going to vote for someone unless I'm 100% on board with everything they say and they do. Good luck finding that person. I'm not running. <laughs> oh, me, so you got, I'm just saying, I, I might 100%. I don't even know if I 100% agree with myself. I don't, and this might shock some of you, I don't come to this church because I 100% agree with Pastor Tony. Maybe, maybe, 98, 99, maybe. Every so often he says something and I go, ah. <laughs> I take 98, 99, I'm pretty good with that. I'll take that. I've not met anyone I 100% agree with. And again, not even myself. So we get caught up trying to find um, the 100% person. And listen, the United States is not a theocracy. We are a constitutional republic. I just covered that. We will be a theocracy someday when Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom. That will be a theocracy. Until then, we're going to have flawed candidates. My Bible says, all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. Harris, sinner, falls short of the glory of God. Donald Trump, sinner, falls short of the glory of God. Every candidate that has ever ran for president is a sinner that falls short of the glory of God. Even the really good ones. Thomas Jefferson, founding father. I've used this example before. Theologically, not real smart. He had a Bible. He took his Bible. He cut out all the stuff he didn't agree with. He didn't agree with miracles. So he cut them all out. He kind of cut and pasted. You can buy a Thomas Jefferson Bible today that's got all the stuff he liked. All the stuff he didn't like, he threw away. Not real smart theologically. But he's considered a pretty good president, right? Uh, Ronald Reagan. I loved Ronald Reagan. I still love Ronald Reagan. Theologically, he got a little better towards the end of his life, but there was a large part of his life he considered himself a deist. He believed in a God. He just didn't really know who it was. Theologically, he was not brilliant. Um, George W. Bush, the second Bush, evangelical Christian when he was a president. But... He also admitted that when he was in college, he kind of used drugs and drank a lot. It was kind of a party guy. Not perfect, right? You will not find a perfect candidate. So don't look for the perfect candidate. You're not going to find them. Uh, Jesus said in Mark 10, verse 18, he says, Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You will not find a perfect candidate. Which leads me to my next point, is you have to vote policies over personality. You cannot vote for personality. You will not find the personality that's 100% perfect. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Again, uh, this does not make me look very good, but 
it will drive home my point. When Bill Clinton ran against Bob Dole, I voted for Bill Clinton. You want to know why? I hated Bob Dole's personality. He was like 73 years old, which ironically today wouldn't even be, I mean, <laughs> Biden's way older than that, Trump's way older than that, Reagan was older than that in the second term. But I, I just couldn't stand Bob Dole. He had this dry, dull personality, and then there was Bill Clinton, and I kind of liked him. I'm like, I would go to dinner with this guy. He's cool. He likes hamburgers, and he runs. He's pretty cool, right? But I, I didn't like Bob Dole at all, so I voted for Clinton. And the weird thing is, is after the election, once the pressure of that election was off, Bob Dole relaxed, and he went on this, this interview tour and did the Tonight Show and David Letterman and all this stuff. And he was actually pretty cool. He just was so uptight during the election, he didn't let that show. Afterwards, I thought, man, I'd vote for that guy. I like him. And I'm pretty sure had, had Dole won the election, we wouldn't know who Monica Lewinsky is. <laughs> it was a mistake. What I'm telling you is I messed up. I voted for personality, right? I voted for personality over policies, and I screwed up. I screwed it up entirely. We need to vote policies, not personality. Because understand that president is just one person. He's going to have a whole cabinet, a whole host of people that work for him, and you're voting for the person that is going to advance God's kingdom the most. You're not voting for a personality. You're not voting for a celebrity. You're voting for a president. All right? Um, I may get through this. I want to, I, some of these policies that I'm talking about, we're voting policies over personality. Who can tell me what their most, their most valued, their most important policy is to them? Mm -hmm. What is it? Abortion. Abortion? Abortion. Second yeah. Amendment? First Amendment? What? The wall? Supporting Ukraine and Israel. Ukraine and Israel? War in general? So foreign relations, right? Certainly would be a list. I, I just kind of made a list. And my list is not going to match yours. It's not an exhaustive list. By, it's not meant to be an exhaustive list. But I, I want to show you how some of these um, issues reflect biblical principles and, and why they're important to me. And the first one I put down was abortion. And I'll be honest, I used to, it used to be the only issue I really even considered. I was an abortion voter. I'm disappointed in both parties, if I'm being honest. The Republican Party has moved to the left, or uh, uh, the Republicans have moved to the left of where they used to be. So I'm not real happy with either party when it comes to this issue. Um, Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14. Don't turn there. You can write it. Just write that down if you want. But for sake of time, I'm just going to read this. It says, For you created my innermost parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you because I am awesomely and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. Uh, Here's what I mean when I say vote policy. Roe versus Wade was overturned during Trump's first administration. In the time Roe v. Wade was the law, millions of babies were aborted. If you don't trust my numbers, go home, Google it, fact check me. Millions. Millions. 95% of babies, as, no matter what, the Democratic Party will tell you it's not, the, uh, the primary cause for abortion is not the health of the mother. It's simply not. 95% is unwanted pregnancy. So millions of abortions, 95% is simply a means of birth control. That's wicked. You can't read God's word. You can't read the psalmist crying out, I will give thanks to you because I am awesomely and wonderfully made and not see that as wicked. That issue is incredibly important to me. 
I don't agree with Donald Trump on it. He, he's restated his opinion on abortion. I don't agree with him. However, during his administration, this is the next issue that is important to me, Donald Trump appointed 226 federal judges. 226 federal judges. Never underestimate the importance of the president appointing judges to the bench. Judges dictate the ethical uh, flow of our country. He appointed 226 in four years, which is a high number. Um, George W. Bush appointed 322 in eight years. Obama, 320. Clinton, 367. Joe Biden has appointed 213 so far in his term. These judges overturned Roe v. Wade. Returning it back to the states to give we the people a vote. In. That's a huge success. Now the numbers are still too high. Honestly, there's still a lot of states that are far off of where the Bible stands on the issue, but that was still a victory. Less babies are being aborted today than they were 10 years ago. And that's thanks to the judges that Donald Trump appointed. If you look at Isaiah 126, again, just write that down. I'll read it to you. It says, Then I will restore your judges as at first, and your counselors as at the beginning. After that, you will be called the city of righteousness, a faithful city. What God is saying through Isaiah is that when you appoint the right judges, they will bring righteousness to your land. They make the laws. They interpret the laws. So if you have the right judges, you will have righteousness right the president appoints federal judges and sets the course for the nation it's important that we have someone in the office that will appoint judges that represent the christian and the church's interests uh, here's why let me skip down to this issue religious liberty if you're an independent business owner if you're a cake baker you should not be forced to bake cakes for a gay wedding. You should have the religious liberty. I'm sorry if that makes you mad, but you should have the religious liberty to say, I'm not doing that. Um, if you, I'm sorry, it's on my list. If you're a pastor, you should not be forced to preside over a gay wedding. Sorry, you should have the religious liberty to be able to say no. Uh, you should have the religious liberty, if you're a doctor, to not perform an abortion. Because it goes against your convictions, your biblical convictions. That's religious liberty. Judges every day are making decisions that will reflect and, and impact our religious liberty. Religious liberty is an issue I, I, that's on my list. Exodus 23, Exodus 20, <coughs> verse 3, says, You shall have no other gods before me. They call that the conscience clause. It's the first of the Ten Commandments. They call it the conscience clause because you should not be forced to violate your conscience and appoint anything above your God. I should value no flag, not the rainbow flag, not even the United States flag above the Christian flag. Right. And if I'm compelled to do so, my religious liberty is being violated. We've been told that we're not allowed to even consider our beliefs when we vote, that's just another way that you will be uh, compelled to just fall in line and do what they want. Not gonna do it. Now, I'm not, hear me out. I'm not saying gay people are evil, okay? Clark did not say that. They're citizens of the United States too. They get the vote too. They're we the people, all right? So I'm not trashing them at all. But I am telling you, I will not be compelled to vote against the Bible. I will not be compelled to violate my religious principles. It won't happen because of religious liberty. And if we vote for the wrong person and they appoint the wrong judges, your religious liberty will be gone. Just telling you, we're moving in that direction. Next on my list, 7.30, so I'm going to wrap this up really soon. Israel. 
watching the news in the last 48 hours? Has anyone seen what Iran has done to Israel? Yeah, 2,000 missiles. 2,000 missiles they've dumped on Iran. Uh, I saw a um, government official in Israel who tweeted that the United States president's uh, administration has already asked him not to respond. Don't defend yourself. Genesis 12, 3 says, I will bless those who bless you, Israel, and the ones who curse you, I will curse. And in you, the families of the earth will be blessed. Sorry, Israel has the right to exist. God ordained that too. He set their borders. Uh, he ordained it. They have the right to exist. They have the right to defend themselves. We live in a world that is growing more and more anti-Semitic every single day. And if you vote for the wrong candidate, it will get worse. I would rather be on the side of those who are blessed than on the side of those who back Israel's right to exist. Go ahead. I'm going to pause it. I'll finish next week. I've got too much. I'm going to cram it in. I want to. So I'm going to pause. It. We'll talk about more issues next week, um, and we'll wrap up our discussion on this. And again, if I made you mad. I do not apologize. <laughs> I love each and every one of you. 100%. Uh, Gary? Yes. Would you close us out in prayer, sir?